Oh hi, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the shed. In this video, which is the final video of the shed project series, I'll cover some of the work I've done since finishing the shed. I'll give you a quick tour of the inside, then I'll cover the total costs of the project, then how many hours it took me to do it in total. And then finally, I'd like to respond to some of the questions and comments I got on all of the videos since starting the project. You'll see I've split the video up into chapters, so if you want to skip to the bits that you're interested in, you can. I picked up some London brackets to install along the back wall of the shed and I used my laser level to install them. I really don't know how I ever managed putting up shelves without one of these, it just makes the whole process so much quicker and easier. And then I could start moving all the boxes back to the new shed. These shelves are going to be useful for our many, many tins of paint. I'm a bit of a paint hoarder to be honest, half of these I'll probably never use. Since we don't have the greenhouse anymore, I needed to make space for our garden tools too. And I thought it'd be useful to have a little bench, nothing special, just something where we can sort through boxes of stuff. And for this I had an offcut of an old kitchen worktop which I got from a skip, and I can use the offcuts from framing the walls to make a frame to perch it on. It's nice to build something every now and again without any plans, just offering things up, marking them, cutting them to length, and making things in a bit more of an organic way. This should do the job just fine. A quick jump test just to check for strength. And it's solid. I'll give you a quick tour of the shed. I keep meaning to fit a latch to the inside of the door just so that I can shut myself in and also stop the wind blowing it open. Uh, I've got garden tools over here, a shelf, um, garden chair, and over here is the sheet materials that I don't generally use in the workshop very frequently. So this is just stuff like melamine. I've got some sheets of glass, which are the ones that I found buried underneath the old shed. They might come in handy one day. Uh, OSB and some chipboard and old kitchen worktop offcuts. Wheelbarrow, weed sprayer, pressure washer and lawnmower. And then our many tins of paint and general rubbish and some tiling stuff. Then over here is the bench that I built and finally I put some corner shelves in where we've got more gardening and barbecue stuff and this is that old lathe that I picked up, not sure what to do with that. Not much else to show really so that's it. Next on to costs, so I said at the start of this project that I wanted to keep the cost of this project as low as possible and my aim was to build the shed for about the same price as I could buy a prefabricated one for but built with better quality materials, more solid and hopefully built to a better standard and completely custom to our needs. When I looked around online the prices of prefabricated sheds that are about the same size as the one I built which is 3.6 by 2.4 meters roughly or 12 foot by 8 foot in size the prices ranged from around 650 pounds right up to about 1750 ish pounds for the better quality ones and when I priced up the job I thought that I would end up spending in the region of 750 pounds or 946 dollars so that was the budget that I had in mind. But then I had various issues with supply of some of the materials I needed, so I think I ended up going a bit over budget, but let's find out. First up, the cost of the actual shed itself, excluding all of the extra bits. The framing timber for the floor came in at about £39 or $50, and I got that from a local sawmill. The sheathing, originally I was planning to buy reclaimed plywood from my local reclamation yard at a cost of £8 per sheet, but they were out of stock and I needed to crack on, so instead of spending £32 in total, I ended up spending £92 or $116 on some new sheets of OSB from my local builder's merchant. So that was a big and unexpected overspend and a big chunk of the budget gone. Onto the walls, the framing timber came to about £98 or $123, that was from a local timber merchant, and the shiplap cladding was also not what I had originally intended to buy. I got that from a timber merchant from about 40 miles away in Suffolk, and the shiplap plus delivery fee came to £327 or $412. The timber for the roof frame came to £68 or $86, and again I had hoped to use reclaimed plywood for the sheathing on the roof, but again I had to buy new. I ended up getting some 5 8 inch or 16 millimeter sheets of plywood for 17 pounds a sheet which coincidentally also came to 68 pounds or 86 dollars. The roof felt was 66 pounds or 83 dollars from a DIY shop. 
Hardware for the door came to £34 or $43. I spent about £10 on screws and £38 on collated nails, although I used less than half of them on the shed, so I'm going to call it about £15 on nails. The perspex for the windows I already had and that was reclaimed, and the clout nails used on the roof felt I also already had. So the total cost of the shed itself came to £817 or $1030, but to complete the project there were other bits I needed to buy such as sand and cement to lay the slab and complete the foundations, the damp proof course plastic, the rodent proof mesh, a water butt joining kit, guttering, and all of that stuff came to an additional £71, so the total project cost was £888, which is $1,120. So it was over budget by about £140, but the bulk of that overspend was mainly due to me not being able to source the second-hand plywood that I had planned to use for the floor and roof sheathing. Now, on to timescales. And these are approximate, and I've listed these in the order of the work that I did. Foundation and floor framing took six hours. Sheathing the floor, two hours. Wall framing, five hours. Roof framing, three hours. Wall assembly and finishing the framing was four hours. Shiplap cladding install was about six hours. Roof frame installation was one hour. Roof sheathing, one hour and 45 minutes. Roof felt, two and a half hours. Fitting the corner uprights, sealing the windows and fitting the trim and adding the soffit boards took another two and a half hours and making and installing the door took another two and a half hours. The total of all of that comes to 36 hours and 15 minutes. So that's about a week's work in total, assuming you work seven or eight-ish hours of work per day. But actually it took about four weeks from start to finish because I had other commitments like working a part-time job and some woodworking related commitments for customers that I needed to get done, life getting in the way, and of course working around the weather. And all of that is just the time it took for the shed build itself, so it excludes the time it took to demolish the old shed at the start of the project, and also installing the guttering at the end of the project and making the workbench and putting up shelves and fitting the paving slabs and that kind of stuff. Next on to questions and comments. First, a few general shed build questions, and then I'll go through questions on each of the specific videos, the floor, the walls, and so on. First up, a question about what would I do differently if I were to build the shed again? Great question, thank you. The two most obvious things that spring to mind are the mistake I made with the roof felt. Rather than following my own plans, I decided to build the roof with a larger overhang at the sides, which meant that I couldn't get two lengths of roof felt out of an eight meter roll, so I had to bodge the roof felt with a bit of a patch. If I could go back, I would stick to what I had originally designed with the smaller overhang, and then that wouldn't have been an issue. I'd also like to have used the overlap 16mm thick style of shiplap as opposed to the thinner 12mm tongue and groove stuff, which I already talked about in the cladding video. A few other things, I would have ordered the rodent proof mesh earlier so that I could have installed it to the frame of the shed before installing the cladding. That way it would be underneath the shiplap as opposed to being secured to the front of it and that would have looked much better and been more discreet. If I could have my time back again, I would have bought some 90mm collated framing nails for framing the walls and the roof. I mentioned in those videos that I chose to use screws as I didn't want to buy a box of 3,300 nails because of the cost. A box of those nails is around £50. But in hindsight, it would have sped things up so much that it would have been worthwhile, even though I'd probably never get through all of those 90mm nails. But that's just the way I am. I have a habit of skimping on things and being overly thrifty sometimes and trying to get away with using whatever I have to hand, which is usually a good trait, I think, but sometimes I get annoyed with myself for just not spending the money to get things done quicker and make things easier on myself. There are a couple of other things I might do differently in relation to the cladding and also the windows, but I'll cover those a little bit later on as I have some specific comments relating to those. Another question, which is about whether I needed any planning permission to build the shed. No, or at least I don't think so. I'm pretty sure this will be well within permitted development, especially as it's basically replicating what was previously there anyway. I'd be lying if I said I'd looked into it in any great detail, but based on my limited knowledge, if the shed is within two meters of the boundary of the garden, which mine is, and the maximum height of the shed is less than 2.5 meters, then it's fine and mine should be well within that based on how I planned it, but let's just measure up and check. So at its highest point, it measures 2,460 millimeters. Planning permission on things like this vary depending on your location. So if you're looking to build or erect a shed, then it's definitely worth checking out what the rules are in your area. 
There's also a great video by Ali Dimmock, which explains it in much better detail than I ever could, which I'll link to in the description box below if you're interested. Next up, questions about the floor. Lots of questions and comments about me choosing OSB. I don't think I realized just how much people hated it. Firstly, why did I choose OSB? I would have happily used plywood or OSB for my shed floor, but OSB was the cheapest 18 mm sheet material available that I could buy at my local builder's merchant, and 18 mm thickness is optimal for structural applications. OSB face grain is actually more resistant to moisture than plywood face grain, and also it's just as strong as the equivalent thickness of shuttering grade plywood in terms of strength across a span, and I believe in sheer strength, OSB is actually even stronger than plywood, although plywood can be a bit stiffer and more rigid. Some asked why I didn't treat the underside of the OSB, and that's because I see no reason to do that because it can't get wet and it's not in contact with the ground. It won't be affected by rising damp because the timber frame that it's secured to had a vapor barrier between it and the concrete foundation. And it shouldn't soak up any moisture from humidity in the air because the shed has a good 50 to 75 millimeters of ventilation and airflow underneath the shed. Also, the end grain of the OSB was protected both with bitumen paint and damp proof coarse plastic. So based on my understanding of how moisture can have an effect on timber, there's no cause for concern here at all. And bugs and wood boring insects don't generally eat into OSB either, as far as I'm aware. I can't imagine the glue that holds it together is very tasty. Plus, it's not in contact with the ground where those creatures live. Did I consider water resistant OSB? No, because again, I don't think it's needed here. There was also a comment about expansion and contraction of the OSB and the fact that I didn't leave a gap in between the sheets, which is interesting and a fair comment. I know that OSB and plywood do expand and contract by very small amounts, but, and this is just my opinion based on my experiences I've had over the years, allowing a three millimeter gap seems excessive to me. I used plywood on the floor of my first shed, my old workshop, which was about five and a half years back and never had any issues with that buckling. And those sheets were buttered right up to one another with no gap. So it's not something I've seen happen before, which is why I don't make allowances for it. But yeah, maybe I should have. But my first thought when I read this comment was about how I would overcome that if it did start buckling. And it'd be pretty easy just to run a circular saw along the joint to relieve any tension. And someone else actually commented with a similar idea, but using the track saw instead. I got a question about whether a concrete base would have been cheaper, and no, it would have actually been a bit more expensive in materials. I can't remember the exact figure for materials when I costed it up as an option, but I think it was in the region of £150 in hardcore for a sub-base, gravel, sharp sand and cement. Plus, I don't have a cement mixer, so I would have needed to either borrow or hire one. But the main problem for me was the access to the shed, as I mentioned in the video. Otherwise, I would have definitely went for a concrete foundation. It's definitely the best option and worth spending the extra money on, in my opinion. But unfortunately, it just wasn't practical. A couple of comments about my use of damp proof coarse plastic and moisture sitting on it, which can then be soaked up by the wood and make it rot quicker. And yes, I think you're right depending on how it gets used, but I was conscious of that, which is why I wrapped it over the end of the timber. And then after that, I installed the cladding over it too. So I can't see any way of any moisture getting into the floor joists. So again, something else that I'm not concerned about. A couple of questions about why I didn't anchor the shed to the ground. That might be common practice in other countries where there might be more chance of storms and strong winds, but that's not common practice here in the UK. It's just not something we do here. And if one day my shed happens to blow away into the nearby field or my neighbor's garden, as you've suggested, then I'll quite happily eat my hat or my shorts. And one final question that was floor related, did I check the floor was level? I checked that the concrete foundations were level before building the floor and they were more or less spot on or within tolerance for me anyway. I didn't show that in the video, but that's just because I cut a lot of stuff out during the editing process to try and keep my videos short and concise. Now onto the walls. Probably the most frequent comment was about my choice of using 2x2 two two timber and a lot of suggestions about using 3x2 or 4x2 instead. In my opinion, it just wasn't necessary to go any wider than 2x2. Two two. Most prefabricated sheds, when you look at how they're made, are built using 2x1s and assembled as panels, so the 2x2 two two timber I used is already twice as strong as those in theory. And it is more than strong enough, it's just a shed, it's not a house, it's not even a workshop, it's somewhere to put garden tools, a lawnmower and tins of paint. 
And these comments made me think about how John Heiss build things compared with Matthias Wandel. Hopefully you're familiar with those YouTube channels. If not, then if you're into your woodworking, then you should be. John Heiss builds things that are plenty strong enough, but he doesn't waste materials, nor does he waste loads of time on building things. He uses his experience to decide how to construct things that will be strong enough. And that's exactly how I approach these things too. Matthias Wandel, on the other hand, will spend time setting up his Panther router to cut multiple mortars and tenons, to make even a simple shelving unit, or his screw advanced finger joint jig to make simple boxes. And that's fine, everyone can build things however they want to build things, and I have nothing but great respect for both John and Matthias, but in my opinion, the way that Matthias build things is usually overkill. Wood is incredibly strong in the direction that the grain is running, so a 2x2 stood on its end can support a huge amount of weight. And as you've seen in the roof video, it had no issues at all supporting my weight, so it's plenty strong enough. Yes, I could have used 3x2s or 4x2s, but it would have added to the cost and for no benefit as far as I can see. There were also a few comments about the wobbliness of the framed walls and suggestions for bracing and reinforcing the structure, but again, in my opinion, it's just not necessary because the cladding is what gives a shed its rigidity. But yes, you're absolutely right, adding sheathing or corner braces would definitely make the structure stronger, but the cladding does more than enough to make it rigid. I think I worked out that I used about 450 nails in total to add all of the cladding to the frame and each of those nails adds quite a lot of rigidity to the structure and you've also got the interlocking tongue and groove on each piece of cladding which also helps so if I were to do it again I wouldn't do anything differently. A few comments about how I fitted the windows and people mentioning that I should have added them to the outside of the frame rather than on the inside of the frame. And yeah, I think that I would have been better off doing it that way too. When I fitted the windows, it's something that I just did without thinking too much about. But yeah, fitting it to the outside probably would have made more sense. That being said, I think how I did the trim pieces and sealed the windows in is going to be absolutely fine, so it's not something I'm concerned about. Someone else mentioned that the Perspex might expand and contract, which could cause it to crack over time, and that's a really interesting point and something that I hadn't considered, to be honest. The holes I drilled through the Perspex for the screws were relatively tight, so yeah, I probably should have drilled them wider to allow for movement. I'll wait and see if there are any issues with it over time, and if there are, I'll have to remove them, drill out the holes with a bigger bit, and refit them. If I do get a crack though, it's not the end of the world, as I have a few more bits of the Perspex that I can use to replace if needed. Next onto the cladding, a few comments about why I didn't use a vapour control layer or breathable membrane to wrap the frame of the shed before installing the cladding. The answer to that one is that I just don't see any good reason for using one here. Condensation isn't going to be an issue inside the shed because it's not going to be insulated. And moisture can't get into the shed from outside because of the way that the cladding is fitted. Yes, potentially some moisture could soak through the cladding into the frame of the shed if the shed gets really thoroughly soaked after lots of rain, but with the stuff I'm storing inside, that's not going to be an issue. A few people mentioned it stopping drafts getting in or bugs, but again, there are no gaps in the cladding for either drafts or bugs to enter. I made sure of that when I fitted it. Also some comments on how I fitted the cladding using only one nail on center to secure the board and some concerns about cupping. I fitted it the way I did for two reasons. One, I think it allows the wood to expand and contract in the best way possible. I think I mentioned that in the video, and two, I fitted it that way when I built my first shed and it worked great. The main concern seems to be about the board's cupping, but I can't see that happening to a point where it's a problem anyway. Maybe in the summer months in direct sunlight it might cup a little bit perhaps, but the boards are held in place not only by the nail, but also the tongue or groove of the board above and below it, so I think any cupping would be minimal. But again, I'll let you know in future if it proves to be a problem. It's been about a month since I finished building the shed and this is the extent of the cupping so far. You can see there's probably about half a millimeter to a millimeter of cupping on each board. And we've had some really hot, dry weather in the past week or so. So I think it's going to be okay. Next, it was the roof video. And the main question on that one was why I didn't clad the edges of the roof. 
that definitely would have been a good idea. Adding fascias to the edges of the roof would have helped to secure the roof felt better and I think it would have also made the roof look better too. If I'd have had more cladding material left over to work with then I definitely would have done it but as you saw in the video once all of the cladding was done I just didn't have enough length to make fascia boards for the roof unfortunately. Having said that, I think how I secured it just with the clout nails will be fine, but maybe one day I'll buy some more shiplap and add some. Finally, the shed door and finishing touches video. A comment about the door needing a bigger expansion gap of five millimeters around the door. Uh, I think I left about three millimeters gap around the door and I haven't had any issues yet, but I may have issues with that in the winter. I'll wait and see. The way I approach things is that I'd much rather leave a smaller gap and if it starts binding at any point, I can just grab a block plane and take off a few shavings rather than making the gap too big. So that's why I left only three millimeters. Also a suggestion about a drip rail along the top of the door opening. And I think that's a really good idea and something that I hadn't thought of. And if I can find a long enough off cut of the shiplap in my pile of leftovers, then I may well add that. So I've just popped out to have a look at adding a drip rail above the door, but actually I don't think it's necessary because of the large overhang on the side of the roof here. So great idea, but I can't see that there's a chance that water will get in here. So I'm not going to bother adding one. A comment about how the screws will hold up over time. I don't have any concerns about that to be honest. I think even zinc plated screws last outside much longer than you might think. Actually Gosforth Handyman has a good video about using regular screws externally. He did some tests on that and I'll link to that video in the description box below if you want to check it out. You might be surprised by the results. Back when I built my first shed, I actually used drywall screws to secure the cladding, which admittedly was not a good idea. However, five and a half years later, and those screws are still holding absolutely fine. I actually unscrewed them and screwed them back in again recently just to have a look and see how they were doing, and they are absolutely fine. By the way, I still own my old house. I'm just renting it out now. I thought I'd better explain that so people don't think that I just jumped over someone's fence just to check on my old screws. Finally, am I going to paint the shed? I'm going to apply some treatment to the cladding and I'll try and work that treatment into the end grain where I can as much as possible to help preserve the wood. I've bought the treatment already, just haven't got around to using it yet. Whether I paint it with actual paint though, I'm not sure, maybe one day, but I actually don't mind how it looks with the green treated timber. Although after a few years, that will start to silver in color. So maybe I'll paint it then. I want to thank everyone that commented on whether me making plans and cut lists for this project would be a good idea or not. I still haven't decided whether to do it or not. If it's something that I can find time to do um, within the next couple of weeks, then I will do. But I'll let you know in future if and when those plans are available. This shed build project has been a really popular series of videos. So I'd like to thank everyone for watching. If you're new to the channel, Thanks for stopping by and please subscribe if you haven't already and also like and click the bell notification option for future videos. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so via PayPal or Patreon, links to those in the description box below. And on Patreon, you can also get early access to my videos, some exclusive content, free project plans and cut lists, and a name credit at the end of my videos. Thank you for watching.